Welcome. Welcome to the latest edition of Postcards from the Apocalypse. Um, always think like what would happen if somebody found all these videos deep into the future, 2150 or something like that, and they look back at this sort of stuff and they go, wow, what was going on then? What a bunch of weirdos. Look at all that crazy shit that was going on in the news. Anyway, this is uh, where I go through the sit rep. Sorry, this is the situational report, the sit rep for the 2nd of July, uh, 2022. It is currently 19 minutes past 8 a.m. on the Australian Eastern Seaboard. Uh, so I'm going to go through some articles here for those who haven't joined before and talk about it from the perspective of prepping and how we keep ourselves safe in this uncertain time that we find ourselves. Interesting times. Things are certainly getting interesting. I'm sure you will agree. Let me play with this camera a little bit. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's jump into it. Oh, first off, I want to say thank you very much, as always, for joining me. Uh, thank you to everyone who's putting comments in. I have noticed a couple of comments uh, about YouTube not allowing you to comment on my videos when I'm doing them, and that's kind of the point of why I put them up on YouTube so you can interact while I'm doing this sort of stuff. Um, I mean, I know there's some of you out there who just like to listen to this stuff, like to listen to the smooth dulcet tones of my voice, uh, but there are others who like to interact. So apologies, I have no frigging clue, zero clue why that's happening on YouTube. If anyone knows why comments would be disabled, I can't find anything on there that says comments are disabled. So if anyone knows, let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to get rid of YouTube. Um, or not get rid of YouTube. I'll just post it up later on YouTube without comments. All right, let's jump into it today. What What is piquing my interest in the past 24 hours? First off, North Korean hackers suspected of $100 million crypto heist. So there was a, a heist, um, a theft from one of the crypto platforms doesn't actually say which one here. Um, something Bridge? I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, there's so freaking many of them, but something Bridge. Apparently, $100 million worth of crypto just like <whistles> disappeared, which uh, nowadays would probably be a lot more crypto because it's <laughs> it's been struggling. Um, this is uh, interesting to me for a couple of, uh, couple of points. There's been these rumors in the past that have been thrown out there by West, by the US mainly, saying that, hey, North Korea is stealing crypto, and that's what they're utilizing to fund their nuclear program in particular, their warlike activities in the nuclear program in particular. So now we see another story come out where it looks like North Korea is doing that. Uh, however, this story I got off Russian propaganda. So... That's that that threw a little interesting slant to it. I'm like, hmm, maybe maybe it is true. Maybe they are doing that, um, or maybe it's just some rapscallions in North Korea who are who are doing some sort of stuff there. But a lot of what comes out of North Korea is state based. So are they doing that? Are they stealing money in cryptocurrency in order to fund their nuclear ambition? Perhaps, perhaps they are. Uh, yet, yet another thing, though. I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm not really decided on this crypto, <laughs> crypto shenanigans yet. Um, and this is another thing. It's like when, when we have a, you know, the, the idea of decentralized economies, I think, is fantastic. The problem is, is, is where, where is the oversight? And a lot of people go, oh, blockchain, blockchain, as if it's some sort of freaking magical, um, unbeatable system or something like that. But there's always there's always vulnerabilities in every system. Usually, it's the human based part. Um, and now here we see that a uh, hundred million dollars just got stolen from crypto. And, and who who steps in to to deal with that? Is there? Do the police go? Oh, you've lost crypto. Okay. Um, yep. We'll we'll send you through to our crypto department, and um, and they can sort it out. No, there is no such thing yet as that. So this is still a bit of the wild west in this space here, I always say, like the, the crypto area is a bit of wild west as far as uh, money goes, as far as economy goes. Just another little warning, I think, to us, or, or, or just a point of interest where we should look at that and go, hmm, that's, that's interesting. Um, and remember, anything that you have can be taken off you. 
all your preps could be taken off you. Don't, I'm not saying don't prep. I'm not saying don't buy crypto. I'm just saying just always have a backup, have redundancy, uh, diversify. Chinese and Russian navies circle Japan in show of force. So uh, an another thing that's been going on in the world where tensions have been rising has been in, in the Japanese area around the seas there between Russia and Japan. Um, they've actually fought wars in the past, gang. Um, if you look back in history, they have fought some wars. Hey, Kieran. Um, what are we talking? I think pre-World War I. Uh, Russia and or or it was it was either pre World War One or in between World War One and World War Two. I'm pretty sure it was pre World War One. Um, they fought a battle uh, or, or you know a war. There was an engagement between Russia and Japan, uh, and everyone was like, <laughs> "Nice try." Japan was like this little backwater at the time. No one really gave a shit. He's behind sort of uh, this little island that, that had been hidden away from the world and, and was thus very far behind. And Russia was one of the big players in the world, and um, Japan came and, and tailed them up. And it was the warning sign to everyone that, hang on, Japan's actually got something going on here. And then, obviously, World War II, we found out that Japan had a lot going on, that <laughs> they uh, they could punch well above their weight. But anyway, there's always been some sort of conflict, not always, but there's been a long history of conflict in this area, and especially when we start to think about who owns oil in the area, uh, like sea drilling oil, who owns fish fisheries and things like that. There's a whole heap of resources. People, like countries want to control spaces like oceans and especially in between countries. Um, different countries want to own that space, i.e. China at the moment with their Taiwan policy, they want to own that entire, entire space there, the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait. But Russia and um, and Japan have been escalating in, in their um, aggressions towards each other. Over the past months, it's again one of these things. It's foreshadowed, uh, like overshadowed by the whole Ukraine thing. So a lot of people haven't had their eye on it. But this is yet another thing. And I haven't mentioned it a couple of times because I, I just like literally there are so many conflicts going on in the world right now that uh, some of them, if, if it's not coming up daily in my newsfeed, I'm getting distracted by other stuff. But this is yet another one. Um, you can almost paint this nice big smiley face, as it were, from Ukraine down through Middle East. Uh, through Pakistan, India, India, China, China, Taiwan, North Korea, South Korea, Japan, Russia, all that area there. It's like the, the semicircle of fire. Burn, burn, burn in the semicircle of fire. Um, but yeah, Chinese and Russian navies circle Japan in a show of force. So they, this is more dick swing, uh, you know, world politics going on. People are starting to wait, waggle their naval might especially china they they're itching to to show the world how big and strong their navy is now um so they're doing a lot of stuff and obviously around taiwan a lot but also here and this shows greater ties also between russia and china we know where this is heading we can see the playbook here we can see what, what direction the wind is blowing here and we need to start thinking about this in a bigger bigger sense um i, I think a lot of people a lot of folk, I'm talking strategic level here, uh, stuff here, guys, by the way. Um, so, like, how does this apply to us as preppers? I'll get to that point. Put a pin in that. I'm talking strategic. What's happening here is there's this idea that something kicks off somewhere. Ukraine war gets big. Uh, tactical nukes get dropped or something. Whew, everyone rushes in. No, not necessarily. Because everyone is distracted right now. Everyone has their own shit going on. Is Israel going to pump troops up into uh, Europe? No, because they're worried about what's going on with Iran. Uh, what's going on with Turkey and Greece? And I'll get to that in a second as well. So that, that ties up another two nations within the Europe area. US is, is rapidly starting to gear towards China now. They can't deal with this Russian thing uh, much longer because they're going to have to deal with China. Like I said, Japan, they're interested in what's happening with Russia. Um, South Korea, interested in what's happening with North Korea, as always. Uh, India, worried what's happening with Pakistan and, um, and China, and possibly soon Bangladesh, not in the sense of them going into any sort of conflict, but Bangladesh is high on the list of collapse nations and uh, what, what I would start to call... Um, 
what would you call this environmental uh, refugeeism? Maybe might be a, a way to put it. So as as our environmental disasters get a bit more crazy, um, we're going to see people start to move move away from them, and that's everywhere. Like people in Lismore in northern New South Wales, if they haven't moved yet, they're probably seriously considering it right now after those devastating floods. I went up there. I checked it out just after the floods and helped out. I, I Honestly, I have been in, many, in quite a few different war zones and places of collapse. And I would probably rather hang in some of those places than I would Lismore at that time. It was horrific. And if I lived in Lismore, well, I wouldn't be anymore. I'll put it that way. I would have seen the writing on the wall and I said, hey, these floods, they're not going to get any better. They're not going to get less frequent. I am the fuck out of here. Geofugi. <laughs> Thanks, Kieran. Geofugi. We'll, we'll use that one. Um, refugeeism is something that I think we need to start thinking about because it's going to start becoming mass. It's going to start becoming a problem and it's going to start becoming a big problem. Just to load in something else on your shoulders there, guys, um, uh, as if like shortages, food shortages, inflation, uh, economic crashes and wars weren't enough. Now we have to deal with mass migration of populations. Yeehaw. Um, yeah, so this here, China, Russia uh, encircling Japan, um, you know, kind of poking them a little bit, going, what are you going to do about it? Well, Japan is obviously... Well, not maybe not obviously to you, but they're, they're we're in an alliance with them, one of the many alliances that are going on at the moment. I think we're in actually two alliances with them. I think we're in that the Friends of the Blue Pacific or whatever the fuck that new one is called, and the Quad. So yeah, and India is part of the Quad as well. So we're we're assuming that these alliances we're shoring them up, going like right. Well, we're all going to work together. We're all going to help out. Are we? What if Pakistan? which is on the edge of collapse right now, goes into collapse and they decide, no, nah, we're going to have to take Kashmir back and we're going to have to do it with force now. India, we're up there. While India is doing that, maybe China's like, oh, let's poke India a little bit and maybe take take some of their land down there or, or use this to, to firm up our, our spot with them, really push them down. All of a sudden, India's out of the picture. Russia starts pushing into China, uh, Japan waters and that distracts them. All of a sudden, it's, uh, it's Australia... And the US, not the quad anymore. And like I've pointed out before, China has been doing some really good stuff in the, the Pacific to sever the sea uh, link, the easy sea link. There's other ways to get around it, obviously, but the easy sea link between US and uh, Australia. So strategic speaking here, um, this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at this big picture and I'm like, ooh, yeah. Um, I think what we should start to think of how we should start to put our mindset here is we're going to have to go it alone, all right? We're going to have to go it alone in the future. That's the writing that I'm seeing on the wall. And I'll, I'll paint this picture is that when the fires hit in 2019, here's a, here's a microcosm example of what I think is going to happen for the macrocosm. 2019, the fires hit, they hit my local little town that I was living in, a uh, little kind of out of the way town, uh, very small fire shed, uh, volunteer firefighters. The captain called everyone in from the from the local area, and he said, "Look, I just got off the phone with um, strategic command for fire command, and they said the fire is going to hit us within twenty four to forty eight hours. We can give you no help. There is no air assets we can we can give you because there was." If you don't know, the fires were pretty much all up and down the east coast of Australia and they were burning huge swathes of land. There was other towns that were in need. So those all those resources have been redirected. Our little town, you're not getting anything. You're not getting any uh, air assets, no helicopters, no uh, planes coming in. You're getting no extra people. You are getting no extra um, plant or uh, uh, firefighting equipment, fire trucks, anything like that. You are on your own. And he brought the town together and he said that. He said, I just got told you are on your own. We're on our own. It's us. It's 13 uh, volunteer firefighters and it's the town here. What do you want to do? And all of us, every single human being there said, 
we we will step up and we all got together and we all turned our utes and our trucks into fire engines and we all fought fires for like almost 60 days straight we all fought fires um and during that time we got more resources more resources were allocated to us we had the us come over and help us out we had people coming from overseas i think canada and the us in particular came over they brought over some of their planes and their helicopter uh not the helicopters their planes that um dumped the water we got helicopters redistributed we got some uh, uh military assets for a little bit here and there um and we got other states uh firefighters come in and help us and, and we did it. The town still stands. The town is still there. I'm now actually part of the um, volunteer firefighters after having fought the fires in that season. And and I will tell you that that we can do this. Okay, what's whatever happens in the future, we can do it. We just need to pull together and we need to have the mindset. This is the mindset of a rural town. This is the mindset of people who are used to doing things a bit tough, are used to being uh, a bit more thrifty and having the ingenuity. It's the old school Aussie mentality, all right? We're a bunch of convicts who were dropped in a shitty, hot, burning land where apparently you couldn't grow anything and baked in the sun for 200 years and what comes out of it. We forged a spirit of people throughout the world wars that we were known throughout the world wars and we've lost it. We've lost that in this time of abundance that we've had, but it is still there. It's still within us. We've been doing so much with so little for so long. And now in the last 50 years, we've had utter abundance in our country and it has made us soft, soft as Play-Doh. But there is still that iron core there. There is still that carved of wood human being. And that's what we need to get back to. That's what we need to start thinking about. It needs to be on us. It needs to be on our backs. It needs to be our hands that are in the dirt, that are turning the soil over or non-till um, uh, growing if you, if you want to go down that path. But we're the ones who are planting. We're the ones who are creating our own food. We're the ones who are supporting ourselves. That's the future that we need to do. And that's what this kind of strategic level information is telling me is going to happen in the not too distant future. And I don't mean to get on here and like freak people out or scare anyone. What I want to do is give you enough fear to enact change. Okay. Fear is not a bad thing. People all the time are like, oh, fear is useless. And you know, you need to live without fear. Bullshit. You do not need to live without fear. Fear is a very, very important human emotion that we need and one of my one of my good friends that i used to teach courses with gave me this little saying you always see these like little fear is the acronym for blah 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 this is one of the best ones i ever heard fear stands for failure expected action required okay so you're looking at something you go well there's going to be some failure here i can either just collapse and go yep okay the failure is here and and then you will fail fail or you can go well there could be failure here that's expected. I need to act now. I need some action. Action is required here. I need to do something. That's what fear is to me. Fear is something that inspires us to actually move and do something. Fear is a fundamental emotion that humans need to learn to harness again. Uh, Kieran says the government has deliberately allowed our softening to happen. They've promoted it. Yeah, well, they're also softer <laughs> as well. Um, so... Uh, on the YouTubes, JS Snuff, just Snuff, just Snuff says, good to see you. Well, it's good to see you too, or see your comment at least. Thank you very much for, for joining today. Um, okay, so that's what, that's, you know, that's my little rant for today. Anyway, let's continue on with the stories. It's about shortages, a lot of shortages today. And I'll whip through these. These were sent to me. This one was sent to me, or a couple of these were sent to me from one of my sources on Instagram. So thank you very much for that. You know who you are. You always do it. Every single night you're sending me stuff and I, and I appreciate everything that you send me. Um, I don't always kind of get back to you and, and have the conversations, but you know who you are. Uh, so thank you. South Africa's biggest real estate investor warns of diesel shortage. Hmm. Um, so what they're doing there, they're having electricity uh, shortages, i.e. what's happening in what's been happening in Australia. They're asking biz, big businesses who have their own backup generators, which are fueled 
by diesel to get them running and pump that electricity back into the grid so we can all have electricity, we can all watch our TV. Uh, South Africans can watch the Springboks or whatever it is that's going on in there at the moment, watch their cricket team lose, uh, get their air conditioners going. However, so much diesel is being used that it's creating a diesel shortage. Like, uh, And I, I touched on this yesterday that right now our leaders are chasing what, what almost what they're doing is catching the falling knife. They, they're, they're trying to fix something and the, the whatever they use to fix this thing, that causes a problem here. So then they try and fix that and that causes another problem there and then they fix that. And at the moment, as nations and as a global interconnected system, we are chasing our freaking tails. <laughs> Don't go down that path. Start to think about how you can support your own self, your own family, your own community, create your own electri electricity. Do it now. Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan's in in a bad way in a couple of different ways. Pakistan is, uh, I would say, teetering on the edge of collapse. Sri Lanka, that's what's what's happened in Sri Lanka. That's what's going to happen in Pakistan soon. Just to give everyone a refresher, Pakistan overthrew their government, kicked out Imran Khan, uh, installed a new government, and that new government is not doing good things. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, didn't fix the problem. Didn't fix the problem. Uh, but they are having textile industries to remain closed <clears throat> amid shortage of gas supply. So they're having a gas supply issue in Pakistan <clears throat> at the moment. They're, they're rushing to get uh, resources out of Russia. <laughs> they're rushing to get it out of Russia at the moment. So they're trying to do that, get stuff from Russia to fuel their economy. Um, but at the moment, it's not working. Te it, it, Industry, textile industries, does that matter? Pakistan? Yeah, it does. It's one of the biggest industries in Pakistan. Throughout that entire subcontinent area. Side note, I always call it subcontinent. And I haven't heard other people say that. Is is that like a is this a PC thing now that I missed? Did I not get the memo that like, well, you can't say that subcontinent? Sub. Um, I, I thought it just meant it was a, 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 its own continent within a continent. Anyway, somebody please fill me in. Um, I'm a little bit behind the times a lot of the time when it comes to like what the latest cutting edge PC shit is, uh, mainly because I don't give a shit, but subcontinent anyway, Pakistan, India, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, these sorts of countries here, textiles is a huge industry all, all throughout there. Um, I like to remind people of that. Been to Bangladesh. Um, next time you're, you're putting on like your, Catman do jacket. Think about the tiny child fingers that the tiny child Bangladesh fingers that helped put it together. Uh, what other shortages have we got? Philippines, a little bit closer to home now. Philippines shortage, uh, bus shortage looms as operators consider scaling down operations due to high fuel prices. Again, so fuel prices are through the roof. Nothing nothing that I've seen is indicating that these fuel prices are going to go down anytime soon. In fact, there are things indicating that they are going to go the opposite way and could even um, exponentially get higher uh, in the not-too-distant future, future. That's a possibility. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying like there are a few factors in there that show me like hmm, if that starts to happen, then fuel price could poof, go through the roof. Um. So, yeah, their, their, their buses are sh uh, starting to shut down. Anyone who's been to this part of the world before will know that uh, traffic is is one of those things. You go to any part, like sort of these areas, a lot of Southeast Asia, a lot of the subcontinent, um, uh, Central uh, Asia, some parts of the Middle East, you can get insane traffic where we as Westerners or Australians look at it and go like, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> Um, public transport's a big thing, though, there. And now they, they look like they're curtailing their public transport or the ability the bus drivers are starting to say, hey, look, it doesn't make sense for us to fill, fill this bus, uh, bus up with petrol. Not going to do it. Not going to drive. That's a pretty big deal. It's going to be a much bigger deal when truck drivers do that with diesel, as I keep talking about. Uh, let's jump over to Greece now. What's happening there? Greece proceeds with purchase of 20 Lockheed Martin F-35 fighter jets. Good for them, you know, buying those um, buying those jets, you know, 
pumping the money into the US economy as they are. Uh, good for them, right? Well, I mean, this comes off the back that Turkey has just uh, announced that they're going to be buying some um, fighter jets as well. They're getting fighter jets off the US. US is just like, oh, look, Greece, Greece and Turkey don't like each other. Hey, Turkey, here's some war stuff. Hey, Greece, here's some more war stuff. Like they're, they're clearly just stoking the fires here and making bank off both sides of this. Um, Greece and Turkey, like them, them being at each other's throats is not a new thing at all. Um, in fact, you could argue it might be one of the oldest things uh, if you've ever read the Iliad. Um, there, are, There's a lot of, you know, a lot of thoughts that, Troy is that Turkey area and, you know, Greece being Greece. So this could be the extension of one of the oldest uh, wars that we, we know. But they're, they're at it again. These two are increasing in tension. There's a lot of stuff going on here. There was a release overnight too where I was talking about um, yesterday the Sweden and Finland uh, got the AOK -okay from Turkey to come in while well, overnight now er Erdogan, er 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 Erdogan, whatever his name is, um, from Turkey has basically said, no, 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 if, if they don't do exactly what we say, we're not going to actually sign off on it. So a little bit of to and froing, maybe they're, they're twisting the screws a little bit, trying to get a little bit more out of the deal, which isn't a deal. Erdogan. Um, what else has Erdogan been up to? He's, he's said he's ready to reinstate the death penalty. Uh, back into his country. So they got rid of it in the 90s, I think. Uh, no, 2004, they got rid of it. Uh, he said, look, if um, if it passes through Parliament and, and the bill comes to me, I'll sign off on it. Sure, we'll bring back the death penalty. No worries. Um, why is that interesting news? Well, this, again, is is kind of like this is symptoms of what's going on here. When we see a world that is heading in a certain direction, that is towards uh, crisis. A world heading towards crisis starts to do things. We start to see certain manifestations. We start to see polarization of, of political parties, which we're definitely seeing. We start to see authoritarian governments be preferred over more liberal governments. And we start to see things like increased punishment within uh, nations and states. And that, so this is another example of that, where we're seeing increased uh, hard-headed, um, closed fist sort of punishment come back into fashion now. Now, if, if you're curious about what I'm talking about now, this sort of theory, uh, I, I recommend reading a book called The Fourth Turning, which I do not have a copy of here. But The Fourth Turning, I can't remember who it's by. Um, I'm sure somebody could probably quickly Google that and chuck it up into the comments. Um, but The Fourth Turning, very, very interesting book. And, and uh, by a couple of pretty pretty cluey dudes, they kind of look at the repeating patterns of societies, of how they go. And basically saying there's kind of four phases that that goes into one big mesocycle phase. Um and what we're in at the moment, as you may have guessed, is the end of the fourth phase, which is the crisis phase. And we're coming up to the peak or the pinnacle, the uh, apotheosis, the, the end point, the big bursting of that final uh, zit, as it were, that final pressure point that builds up in that crisis phase. So you kind of go through like almost like um, seasons, I guess. You might want to you might want to put it, but you know we, the last big one we had was obviously World War Two, and then you've got this golden era where everything's cool, and then you've got uh, an era where things start to go. Oh, you've got a building phase, and you've got a cruising phase, kind of, and then you've got this unraveling phase, and things are getting a bit weird, and then you've got the crisis phase, and each one of these is you know 20, 25 years each, or a generation, and the reason that each one has a certain th theme or feel to it and why it repeats is because we are built off the the humans of one generation are raised by the humans of another generation to all to uh, away so you know we're, we're feeling this sort of stuff and these effects and and 
to a, a relatively uh, pretty accurate point, this book lays out how these things work. And and for me, like reading this book, it it brings a lot of um, it brings a lot of comfort or relief in, in a sense that like ah yes, what we are doing now is playing out. It's not going to make anything's better any of the things better for us, but. I think we can look at it and then go like, it's the end of the world as we know it. And I like to really iterate this to people. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's not the end of the world, okay? It's a change. And sometimes that change can be a bit more painful or a bit more dramatic or a bit more, uh, have a bit more velocity to it. But we're always in change. We're just in a particularly... Uh, high pressured part of that at the moment. Uh, Kieran, thank you very much. Neil Howell and William Strauss are the authors of that book, The Fourth Turning. So thank you very much for that, Kieran. Um, yeah, that's another book I recommend. Have, have a read of that one. Wrap your head around it. It's quite, quite a good uh, good read. And I think it's it's good uh, sort of antidote to some of the hysteria that can come with what's happening today. Um, the world's not going to blow up. I mean, it might blow up. I, I don't know. But <laughs> what we are, we're, we're in a cycle. We're in a cycle and we're in a certain point. It's more of a spiral because we're continuing to move forward in time. But when we're at this part of the spiral, it was exactly the same as this part of the spiral, this part of the spiral. So when you're thinking about it, you know, why are we, why, you know, what's going on now? Why are we getting pushed into war? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it might have something to do with the fact that um, from my perspective, the people who usually advocate kind of more strongly for war or, or, or maybe they don't advocate for it, but they're kind of willing to, to push into it a little bit uh, without the thought of what it, its consequences are, are the people who don't know what war is. If you knew what war was, you would be pretty reluctant. You would be doing a lot of other things and you'll probably be planning, structuring things to, to try and not be in a war. Uh, that's my take on it anyway, as somebody who has been to war. That's that's my take on it. So, you know, we've got a generation of people who were trying to dodge drafts and were doing anything to get out of a war, i.e. Vietnam, who are now in power and ironically are pushing the back of our youth into another world war. Funny how that works, eh? Not funny, haha. All right. Anyway, um, let's look at what's uh, India back onto the subcontinent. Um, seven dead and twenty plus missing in devastating Indian landslides. Weather effects again. Uh, huge weather effects. Deluge of rain. This is not something that is unexpected in India. There's a monsoonal season there, uh, but you know when we when we start to see this, we've got more and more humans on the earth. They push out into more and more areas, areas where they haven't, where we haven't lived traditionally before. Plus, we've got increased weather effects. There is increased heat within the world, uh, like average global temperatures, which puts more water up into the atmosphere, which means more water comes down. That's the that's the very like grade three version of it of what's happening at the moment. Um. And I mean, these are things that we can track. You, you don't, you don't need to be like a client, a climate change denier or anything like that. I'm not saying how this came about. I'm not saying that us putting carbon dioxide into the, the atmosphere had anything to do with it, or whatever you know, whatever it was. Blah blah blah. I'm just saying that this is actually what is happening at the moment. You can track. You can go on to uh, many different websites from many different weather bureaus around the world and you can say hey what's the average temperature that you have been tracking in your seas okay yeah it's it appears to be increasing over the past 20 years that could be just a normal thing that happens on earth and we just haven't tracked it before um and you know we've been through climate change before because the climate is always changing like i said before it's not it's, it's not that things don't change and boom, all of a sudden we're seeing change now. You know, the end of the world is always happening. Uh, everything is always changing. It's just sometimes it happens a little bit faster or sometimes like accelerated. Sometimes it's a little bit more severe. Sometimes we notice it a bit more. And uh, again, uh, I'll point back to this book, The Fourth Turning, is sometimes we've got uh, a structure of human beings and a psyche of human beings. So these people are on top 
you know, in charge boomers, um, then you sort of, uh, Gen Z or your 13ers are kind of coming through and they're starting to be the ones in charge. And there's this, you know, uh, changeover of power that's slightly starting to happen now. And then you got uh, the millennials doing their thing, being the main workforce at the moment. But it's it's that, that flavor of human beings that when some crisis does happen, like crises as we're seeing at the moment, at certain points in history, if certain groups were in control of what was happening and a crisis happens, then it's mitigated. It doesn't really matter so much. But right now we're getting a crisis and the way that the people who are in charge at the moment are dealing with it is probably exacerbating it or making it worse. And that's why we're in the crisis phase of the turning at the moment. Um, what else is happening? Chocolate giant gets a salmonella scare. Again, your food is not safe. Do not eat food. Only, you know, we can only trust certain foods from certain areas. All the food not, needs to be taken out of your mouth. Um, yet another poisoning type activity or um, what would you call it? Uh, tainting of a food system here. This one's in chocolate. Uh, so this is a huge chocolate factory which uh, supplies liquid chocolates to retailers like Hershey's, Nestle, Unilever. Unilever chocolate? Mm. Um, yeah, and uh, they've come out and said, well, we've got uh, the, there's possibly some salmonella in there, so stop it. Everyone stop what you're doing. Trash it. No no good. No good. Um, I'm always wary about this stuff that's, that's fucking with our food system. I don't, I don't like it at all. Um... Hosted John, coming from Scandinavia, says, climate change. My great-grandfather was the last one to grow cereals on the farm here. The climate got too cold. I hope it gets back to normal so I can grow it. Um, yeah, this climate change. Again, I grew up in the 80s, and when I was a kid, it was all about CFCs. There was way too many permed hairs getting spray, hair sprays and stuff like that. So we're all about like these CFCs going up into the atmosphere because the ice age is coming. We're going to freeze the earth. Okay, that's what was happening. And then all of a sudden it became, actually it's global warming. We're putting too much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and we're warming the earth too much. Um, so, I mean, these things happen. The climate changes. If we go back a couple of, or, you know, 10,000-ish years, then huge parts of the world that people were living in now, i.e. like yourself, uh, Jose John, who's in Scandinavia, was under hundreds of metres of ice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, the, the climate changes and, and we just need to, to understand that and we need to adapt with it, with what's going on. Uh, the, old, the old butterfly on the, the branch analogy I think works well that we can say you can walk up to a butterfly and this butterfly might live for three days butterflies some butterfly species don't live for very long at all butterfly lives for three days and it's been sitting on that branch for three hours so for a good chunk of its life it's been sitting there and go hey uh hey butterfly like is that branch stable and the butterfly would say this this branch is beyond stable this branch is permanent and you go, oh, no, 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 it, it could grow and it could fall off and it could break and all sorts of things. And at one stage, it was a tiny little thing. The butterfly would laugh. <laughs> the branch is eternal. The branch has always been and always will be. You're an idiot. Branches don't move. Branches are the most solid thing on earth. But we live for a little bit longer. So we know that branches start as tiny little uh, twigs and they grow out and they turn into a branch and eventually they fall, especially if they're a eucalyptus tree and it's been raining, don't camp under eucalyptus trees, kids. Uh, they're called widow makers for a reason. So we know that that, that happens, but the, to the butterfly, they go, no, this, this is always the way it is. Human beings are also exactly like this. We sit here and we go, this is the way it is because it's always been this way, 100%. We, we must act as if the world will always be this way, but it's not always this way. And, and the environment and the weather is a prime example of that. Prime example. Um, Host T. John, pro preferably wheat. You'd prefer to grow wheat. Uh, he grew barley. Your grandfather grew, 
grew barley. Um, that's cool. Um, they made us go home and give our mothers a bollocking. Talk about brainwashing. Because of the hairspray that was, yeah. I remember this. I remember as a kid, like, being told this, like, hairspray is good. And I remember going home and watching my uh, teenage sister at the time spraying her, her coiffed, permed hair up. And going like, oh, you're killing the planet. Like, you know, all the CFCs, don't you worry about this? Um, and people did worry about it. People worried about it a lot. Imagine that. I mean, there was a lot of perms around in the 80s. No doubt. No doubt about that. I mean, you know, um, Poison, Scorpion, uh, to a certain extent, even Guns N' Roses, Van Halen, they, they got a lot to answer for. All right, they were trendsetters of their day, and they were they were rocking some pretty big hair do hairdos back then. So, um, but but was there so much hairspray getting sprayed that we were going to change the environment? Hmm, I don't know. Uh, th this is another one of these things. It's like anti intellectualism is like a cancer in our society. It's like an absolute cancer in our society that it, it, we are being taught and trained and reinforced to not think things through, to not have a rational mind, to not utilize our rational mind. And we must, we must fight against that trend. It's one of the biggest things that I think we, we can do in form of rebellion today is to just stop and go like, wait, what, what would common sense dictate here? What is rational? Can I actually play this out in my mind in a rational way? Is it true that cow farts are to blame for global warming? Does that make rational sense to me? Does that make rational sense that something that is natural, that occurs in nature, that has been here for hundreds of thousands of years, and uh, there's evidence that in one, one way or another, either through oryx throughout uh, the European area or bison throughout the Americas uh, or all sorts of other animals all throughout the world for hundreds of thousands of years have been eating grass and farting methane, does it make sense that all of a sudden now they're doing it and it's destroying the earth? Or, or could it be just, just a good crazy guess? <laughs> Could it be a whole heap of cars and industry and a whole heap of other things that we do? Might that be having an effect? Possibly. I don't know. You know, I'm just an idiot. Don't think. Don't don't use your rational mind. Not, not going to happen. Um, were we the cows of the 90s? <laughs> were the hairspray cows of the 90s? Um, definitely. <laughs> All right, what else is happening? Uh, Japan mulls post Fukushima nuclear plants reopening. So, uh, Japan, what are we talking about? Like 15 years ago now? 2011 catastrophe, right? 10 years ago. Um, they obviously had that earthquake, that huge um, uh, tsunami that came in. A whole heap of bad stuff happened. Um, Fukushima nuclear power plant was one of them. Again, uh, nuclear power has some pros and cons, and this is definitely one of the cons. But I will say this, nuclear power and the the where, where it's gone bad and it's gone horrifically bad a couple of times, i.e. Three Mile Island, uh, Chernobyl, Fukushima, what this is evidence of is a human beings, a current human beings' lack of ability for long sight, for long forethought. We cannot think, We like barely we can think more than 30 minutes now, but uh, we can't think four years in the future. We And, and people are like amazed that, that uh, China can think 10, 15, even have rough plans for 50 years in the future. People are like, whoa, it's amazing. It's nothing. We need to be thinking 350 years. We need to be thinking 1,000 years. We need to have 10,000-year mindsets when we're talking about shit like nuclear power. Nuclear power could could solve some of the world's problems easily. And when we solve these problems, which are so huge, uh, it will instigate the solution of other problems. Just like we've ha we're having collapses in certain areas at the moment, and it's pulling in other things, and it's making this worse, like 
uh, fuel costs more, right? Just to, just to, you pick an arbitrary point right now. Fuel costs more. Okay, well, that means it, it costs more to, to get food around. Ah, food costs more. Okay, well, if food costs more, people are going to buy less and, and less of this. Well, we're going to produce less. Okay, now we've got food shortages. Ah, okay, see, so this thing starts becoming a self-licking ice cream. Or we've got food shortages, so food costs more, blah, blah, blah. This this thing keeps going around and around. Now, I can pick, you know, 15 different factors that are happening at the moment where this is going to do it. But the opposite is true. Just like that becomes a downward spiral, we can create upward spirals where we fix one thing and we make that solid and that works. And then that spreads into another industry or another system. And that makes that work better or more efficiently. And that makes that better. And that makes that better. And that makes that better. It's the golden version of capitalism, really. It's how capitalism should work <laughs> when people don't get um, too crazy. Um, P Please listen, sorry, this is from uh, Hosett John. Please listen to the speeches of Mr. Gallen Windsor, one of the first nuclear engineers in the USA. He proves that nuclear radiation, I think that's supposed to say, is not as dangerous as claimed. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not like a massive advocate for nuclear power. I'm just saying that at this point in time, this needs to be something that's on the table that we need to consider. Okay, nuclear radiation, like, yeah, it is a thing. I, I've never felt it before, but, you know, we've all heard the stories about it. I don't know. This this might be worthwhile listening to this, um, what Jose John is saying here, Mr. Gallon Windsor. So um, I might check out some of those speeches that uh, he said. Now, what I am talking about, though, is what we do have is an energy crisis and it's getting worse. So on top of environmental effects being that Japan is cooking, is baking at the moment in 35 degree plus weather, um, please hold the laughter if you're an Australian, oh, 35 degree weather. So what, an average summer day? Like, and? <laughs> Call me when it gets 45. Um, no, but they're baking anyway. They've got a lot of problem. Obviously, a lot of air conditioning going on there. Uh, that's draining the power, and they uh, they don't have enough energy. They're running out of energy. Blackouts are being instigated. So they're starting to say, "Hey, look, we shut down all our nuclear power plants after the Fukushima one went went tits up. Let's start to open them up again." So they have opened one, and they've just put in plans to open another four. I think. Um, to, to put this in, in perspective, there was 54 reactors that were in operation in Japan before the 2011 catastrophe over there. Um, and that supplied about 30% of their power. Now, imagine cutting 30% of your power. It's going to have to come from somewhere. We've got coal-generated uh, power plants, um, which we can still keep pumping up out. And But coal needs to be shipped around the world. Japan doesn't have coal, so it needs to buy it from somewhere. Uh, and price of coal is going up. Maybe Japan can get it from Russia. <laughs> Smooth things over there. Uh, but, you know, this, this whole thing is like there's no easy, simple answers here. But we need to start thinking about this. We can't just live off asking people to use diesel generators. We can't just use coal for the rest of, rest of time. That's going to run off out at, at a certain point. And the side effect of... Uh, generating energy through coal, burning coal, is obviously pollution. This is one thing I like to point out to people. I don't care if you're a climate denier or not. I always say there's three major problems with like kind of using these fossil fuel uh, initiatives that we've been using with this cheap energy. Uh, there's, there's a number of other sort of other side problems, but these are the three big problems. So, yes, it's potentially causing climate change, but if you want to take that one off, the table okay let's take it off the table here's the other two that you cannot deny is a fax with fossil fuels pollution there is a side effect for using fossil fuels for using petrochemicals for using coal anything that we dig out out of the ground uh, and burn there's a side effect of it and that is pollution and pollution is 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 real it builds up and we we don't deal with it very well at the moment so there's that side effect the second is uh, that it is non-renewable. It's a one-way street, and eventually we're going to run out of it. Eventually, 
we run out of fuel altogether. We get peak oil and that's uh, it all declines from there. We're going to hit peak coal and it all declines from there. What are we going to burn then? What are we going to power our steam engines with then? That sounds funny, doesn't it, steam engines? Hmm. Um, for those who don't know, we invented the steam engine back in the... I mean, the, the invention of the steam engine is much, much older, but we started really utilizing steam engines back in the 1800s. We still use them today. Nuclear power isn't like some fucking magic thing, like this growing green rock and, and the energy just gets sapped out like something on Stranger Things. Nuclear power <laughs> heats a rod to super hot, super, super hot uh, temperatures and then we get that rod and stick it in water and the steam comes up and the steam spins a, a turbine, just in case you didn't know that. <laughs> you think we're so technologically advanced, we're still using fucking steam power right now to generate electricity. I mean, for frick's sake, we're still basically using small explosions to, to like fight wars. Where are the rail guns? Where are the laser guns? We haven't got to Starship Troopers yet. Actually, they were still using bullets, I think. You know, where, where's all the cool tech? Where's our phases set to, set, set to stun? That's what I want to know. Um, old school technologies. Old school technology. All right, I've, I've missed a few here. Galen Windsor, I'll send you a link if I remember it tomorrow. Uh, it's about 105 in the morning there. Where's John, man? Go to bed. Come on, man. you got you got to get up and farm in the morning. Bro, people are depending on your food. <laughs> Um, how about rediscovering free power, electromagnetism? Yep. Well, you know, these are the sort of things we need to start really moving towards. Uh, did you read, see anything about the farmer protest in Holland today? Yes, I talked about that yesterday. Um, media blackout here in Norway. They protect the, the WEF corporation with their government, making unrealistic environmental poli politics and law. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is happening all across the world right now. There is this huge campaign, this, this green campaign and um, I'm always weary, wary of any campaign that's like, we're going to go do the right thing um, and kind of generates groundswell from that that perspective because when you start to see things coming out of the government that is taking the moral high ground, I'm, I'm really sceptical for it because bad things happen when governments do that, i.e. That, that's how communism comes about. Hey, we'll all do the, the right thing for each other, right? Yeah, but it doesn't work out that way. What ends up happening is some very, very, very bad things. Um, so, yeah, like, hey, we're just going to shut down this industry or cripple these people or put these restrictions on all this sort of stuff. So then you have to go green with your gardening practices. And and real farmers who are just trying to get food out to the people, like, hey, what the, like, you, you're, you're stopping me from doing what I'm, I'm doing. It's not like there's 100,000 farmers out here. It's like under 3%, under 2% now, I think, in most developed countries are farmers. Okay, there's a tiny amount of people who are making the food for everyone and we're freaking crippling them. So Holland got up in arms. The farmers blocked the highways with their tractors and got out there and good on them for doing it. But I would say even next step, I would go Atlas Shrugged on this one. This is where we're going to head now. We're going to Atlas Shrugged type uh, <coughs> spaces where the, the Atlas Shrugged, right? The, pe the people who are bearing the weight of the world, who are doing everything, need to just fucking flip that world off and walk off. And we need to go on strike. We need to say, hey, if you if you keep beating up on the people who are doing everything, then the people who are doing everything just should stop doing everything and see how you work, see how that works out for you. All right. I.e., you know, one of my little personal gripes is I feel like as, as, a, as a white male, I'm, I'm quite often, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a pretty easy target on me right now in, in um, the developed world. I'm like, cool, all right, you guys go fight your own wars then. If you don't want Neanderthals like me walking around and speaking my mind, I'll go shut up and I'll go sit in a corner or I'll go out to my land and scratch in the dirt and grow my own food and uh, you guys can just sort yourselves out for a while. Good luck with that. Have fun with that. Um, yeah, th this is something we need to really be cognizant of because this isn't this isn't just some like entitled white guy like myself um, getting up here and bitching. This is the people that grow our food, all right? They grow the food for the masses. And that, like I said, when those masses can't eat, anarchy ensues. Um, they stole, killed, and hid all the good shit they couldn't make money from, coming from Kieran, uh, talking about 
um, powering stuff, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, I am Black Lux says, how do we keep food for longer without it spoiling? I did this previously and moths got to them. Uh, I'm talking storing food and prepping. Uh, and Kat Griggs, hey, how you going, Kat, uh, says, yeah, I want to know the answer to that too. And then Kieran comes up with vacuum bags and airtight sealed containers, nailed it. So I've talked about this in the past, long-term storage of food, you need to be canny about this. You can't just go like, eh, I bought a bag of rice and throw it on the shelf and that's it. You're going to get weevils in that shit. Uh, you're going to get all sorts of bad things. Any sort of grain, there's a good chance you're probably going to have weevils or something similar in it right now. But the thing is, we buy it and then we use it within a year or so. And so we don't really notice that sort of stuff where, you know, you're probably going to consume that, which makes me chuckle to all the vegans out there because they're like, I'm just eating oats. And it's like, you're eating bugs. All right. You don't know it, but you're eating. They're crunched up in there. Um, <laughs> canny. <laughs> yes. No pun intended. Uh, what you got to do. Okay. So, um, there's a number of different things you can do here. We can, how we long-term store food. We can look back at old ways we used to do it. There's dehydration, there's um, uh, smoking, all these sorts of things. There's freezing if you've got the ability to. Or we can look to futuristic sort of ways. We've got freeze drying, which is a cool way, but that's pretty expensive to do. Now, how I store my food, I get my rice, um, I pour it into mylar bags and I, I, I seal it in a big bag, a big mylar bag, or for some of it, I'll break it down into small mylar bags. Mylar bags are silver looking bags that are air, like air can't get in, uh, um, sun can't get in, and you know they're moisture proof as well. So what I did, I, I ran an experiment and it worked pretty well. And let me know if anyone's tried this as well. I got a huge bag of rice and broke it down into little like 100 gram mylar bags threw a couple of um, oxygen absorbers in there and sealed the top i didn't vacuum seal it or anything sometimes i vacuum seal stuff but i got the mylar bags little ziploc mylar bags chucked the rice in chucked o2 absorbers in sealed them up rode on it when i did that when i bought it and what how much right and what it is and what rice is in there and then put that on the shelf and i've watched them over the past two months as the oxygen absorber does its thing and takes all the oxygen out of it, seal themselves. So they're actually now vacuum sealed themselves. And um, and it's pretty cool. So that's gonna that's gonna last a lot longer. Then what I do is I take those mylar bags when I'm long-term storage and I get a big, I, I buy from my local hardware store here, big plastic um, drums. So I've got a whole heap of different size ones that I use for different things. So heavier items go into a smaller one. So it's not uh, as heavy at the end of the day, lighter stuff, maybe like flour and that go into the bigger um, drums, almost some some are big, big drums, like sort of 44 gallon size. Other ones are a bit smaller than that. And, th and they've got a ratchet seal on them. So you put the lid on, your ratchet seal. Again, they're, they're, my ones are blue, you can get black ones. Um, and I throw oxygen absorbers that you would put in a cupboard into that, into that thing. So Things are sealed in mylar bags, put into the drum. Inside the drum, I've also got another oxygen absorber. I then seal that up. I write on the top in pen what's in there, the date that I put it in there, and I have all that tracked. And then that is put in a uh, area which is uh, out of sunlight and out of the elements and relatively stable temperature. That is one of that's pretty i reckon like it sounds like a convoluted process but it's really not that hard it, it is really not that hard once you get mylar bags you just i literally just get the rice i put it in the bag i throw a handful of uh, o2 absorbers in seal it right on that put it in the tub seal the tub done all right and that's going to last uh, I've, I've extended the life of that rice for at least two to three times of what it would have been otherwise um where are you going to find Mylar bags? As Oz Farm Living has said, I get mine from Survival Supplies Australia. So jump on survivalsuppliesaustralia.com.au. Follow the tabs to, what is it, uh, like prepping or food, long-term food storage. And they should have on there O2 absorbers and Mylar bags of different size. To give you a scope, the, the big ones, 
will fit a 20 kilo bag of rice all the way down to small ones that are about yay big. So get the ones that are appropriate to your size. All right. Um, what else have we got here? Rationing has already started in Europe as entire globe plunges into horrific economic nightmare. Uh, countries in Europe are already beginning to ration certain things due to supply problems. This has been happening for a little time now. It's not anything new. Um, so, you know, we've been seeing this. Uh, Italy, like, had shortfalls in oils and things like that. Greece had some shortfalls, and especially with grains and stuff like that. Spain had some. We're also seeing energy rationing happening within Europe. Uh, this story in particular was saying, hey, how long till it happens in the US? And I think this is what we have to ask as well. How long until this happens in Australia? What we're seeing at the, at the moment in, in Australia is rationing of the spoilt nature that we have. So I go into my local supermarket and I've been into several supermarkets because I'm always watching this sort of stuff and I'm interested in it. So I go, I go and have a look and I'm noticing the amount of brands that are available, no longer available, huge like holes. Like, yeah, there's still four different sources but there used to be seven and there's just gaps where these brands just don't exist anymore. So that's that's what we're starting to see now. So if you do have a, a certain brand that you like, i.e. you like Sriracha sauce, um, Sriracha sauce, the spicy red sauce stuff, that's going to be in hard supply in the next month or two. Um, like we won't get any, I'm, I'm guessing. So if you like that stuff, go and stockpile on it now. Um but yeah, this, this sort of stuff is going to start happening. It's going to start rippling out to the rest of the world. We're going to see less soon. So get on it. Uh, and on this, on the US, uh, funny little story that came out here, the White House tells Americans, suck it up for the sake of liberal world order. So one of the uh, White House representatives has come out and basically said, look, we're, we're trying to preserve liberal world order by um, fighting this war in Ukraine and, and banning oil coming out of um the uh, out of russia and yes we know that it is causing pain at the pump but look we just we, we have to do this we're, we're fighting the good fight and everyone has to do their part gang um and by the sounds of it a lot of average americans are, are just like they're starting to turn the, the sun go like you, you know what I, I actually don't really give a shit about ukraine that much i care about the fact that i'm having to put 150 dollars worth of fuel into my car every week and that's really really hurting me so we need to you know do something about that this again is just yet another example i'm finishing off on this story just an example to, to show you that the 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 big machinations of world leaders and these huge big strategic moving parts doesn't get felt by the people making the decisions it gets felt by you and me at the fuel pump we're the ones who have to pay the bill at the end of the day and when all this econ economic fallout gets really hectic it's you and i who are going to have to be paying for this through taxes and through inflation for the next 10 15 20 years it's our children that are going to have to be doing it uh it's not these over over entitled and very well off politicians that we have democratically elected um, our democratically elected aristocracy are not the ones who feel the pain on this hey dog she's coming to tell me that it's time to get off um, just just a couple of quick uh, things here Oz farm living says they're already already in the USA they haven't got any I think you're talking about the the, the source there uh, Jose John still hasn't gone to bed yet Keep kicking, man. Um, they are pushing a fake bird flu here now up in Scandinavia, I think. Um, just waiting for chicken ownerships to get prohibited. Man, like, that's going to burn me. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to take that one very well. Uh, and Kieran says, try, also try vivopack.com.au. That's spelled V-I-V-O-P-A-K.com.au for Mylar bags and stuff like that. Um so that's it for today, gang. My dog's bugging me, so I'm going to have to take her for a walk in this freezing, cold, wet weather, but that's what we do. I'll go get a coffee. I'll be fine. Um, as always, if you've got any other questions or anything that you've can't come across that you find interesting, please feel free to send it through to me. Um, I'm going to keep banging out these, these, uh, these little updates and stuff like that, these little sit reps. 
I love it. I'm having fun. But I think it's important that we all stay abreast of what's going on and we can all try and look to the future to see what's going to happen and keep ourselves as prepared as possible. Um, that's that's the goal. We're all working here together. And I want to thank every single one of you for, for jumping in here, for all your comments. And if you didn't comment, if you just watched along, thank you very much for, for listening in on it. Um, uh, Hose it, John, I'm a security guard at night. It's got to pay for the fertilizer. Damn, yeah. Yeah, fertilizer ain't getting any cheaper. Um, so, yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, keep prepping, everyone. Keep Keep it going. Keep working. Um, I woke up at 1.30 in the morning this morning and it was raining and freezing cold here with the fear spike because I just remembered I'd left all my seeds that I just planted out <laughs> out of the greenhouse. Um, so I've got to go check on them this morning because they're probably destroyed now. Uh, hopefully not. Uh, just stick them back in a little greenhouse and hopefully they'll pop up, get some late winter veggies going. But yeah, if you get the chance, get out there in the garden, start growing, start or continue, I should stay, say, uh, prepping, putting away food. We talked about this today. Get those Mylar bags, jump on those websites, either vivopack.com.au or survivalsuppliesaustralia.com.au. Um, stay frosty. I will. <laughs> Real frosty. Um, and apart from that, Semper Paratus.